Hello, welcome to By the Well podcast, produced by the community at Wall Street United Methodist Church in Jeffersonville, Indiana. We focus on clarity, compassion, and community. You will hear sermons as well as conversations about the intersections of faith and life. If you enjoy this podcast, like and share below. The New Testament reading is from Acts chapter 12, verses 6 through 17. The very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while guards in front of the door were keeping watch over the prison. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his wrists. The angel said to him, fasten your belt and put on your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter went out and followed him. He did not realize that what was happening with the angel's help was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. After they had passed the first and the second guard, they came before the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord and they went outside and walked along a lane when suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many had gathered and were praying. When he knocked at the outer gate, a maid named Rhoda came to answer. On recognizing Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the gate, she ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind, but she insisted that it was so. They said, it is his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking and when they opened the gate, they saw him and were amazed. He motioned to them with his hand to be silent and described for them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he added, Tell this to James and to the brothers and sisters. Then he left and went to another place. The word of God for the people of God. I've missed y'all. I've been out and about running around doing things. And so I was really grateful that that, uh, when we were planning for this series, can you hear me okay? All right, awesome. We were were planning for the series um, that I I got this specific text. Um, It's a favorite scripture for all sorts of reasons. It's one we heard a lot in uh, youth group um, for lots of of humorous and serious reasons. And we're going to talk about some of those. But this series that we've been guiding through that's come to this point that we're wrapping up today, um, the Pentecost Forward series, is about how the Holy Spirit is altering people and communities. Uh, the collection of stories the early church of the early church um, movement and these Jesus followers is found in the book of Acts. And I, it would be easy for me to say, well, we're just going through the book of Acts. But it's important sometimes to be reminded that these are collections of stories in order for a purpose that we, we look at sometimes too easily, we can flip it open, and I'm old school, so I actually flip open the book, or we can tap our screen, right? Um, these were the stories of the earliest movements. So these Jesus followers are sourcing these stories and then sharing them. They're wondering and how far and how wide this thing might go. We've looked at how the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, altered in our witness It alters us on the edge of belonging. I love the language of that title. The title alone makes me want to listen to the podcast, right? Um, The edge of belonging. We are are, uh, altered by the Spirit alongside our enemies. That was a big one. That's a big one. And today we'll be looking at how we're altered by the Spirit through stories that are too good to be true. What a, what a, I thought, oh, that's a, that's a fun title. Um, it's our hope the spirits make, that it's our hope, oh goodness y'all, did I tell you that I helped with camp too? <laughs> All right, there's evidence. 
Um, it's our hope that this series gives you the ability to not just connect yourself to the earliest church movement, not to connect yourself to 50 years ago, or even five days ago, but maybe five minutes ago, that maybe five seconds ago, maybe just now, that we realize that this spirit, this Holy Spirit in us is altering us actively. It's always happening. It's always um, calling us into new things. Um, what I'm constantly return to, returning to from this series that has been so fruitful is that um, it's not just happening with me. I don't have this, this feeling because of this series and because of who y'all are to me and, to, and hopefully we are to you that, that I don't have to think about all the ideas that God's going to do in Wall Street. <laughs> I don't got to come up with all the list. We're doing this in community. The Holy Spirit's speaking to all of us and then we're getting together and saying, what's, what's a good move? What's, what's next? And then we come up with backpacks, right? And it's, we've done it before, but it's always like, oh, we're going to do, it, we're gonna do it again, and we're excited about it. You know, even the things that happen over and over again. But it's, this story is important, and I, and I want to ask you, I mean, don't you just love a good prison story? <laughs> People that come to me and they're like, the Bible is old, y'all. It's boring, I heard it all the time, I grew up here, I don't want to dig into it, it's not that great, I want to read the next, pick your author. And then you come up to something like this, and you think, I do love a good prison story. I love a good jailbreak, right? And that's what it is, and we should laugh about it. I, I, I also, though, a good, uh, we, we like this because we like other things that are good stories, right? Um, I grew up listening to Johnny Cash, I grew up to Folsom Prison Blues. May of 1968, not too long ago. Amen. The very first album was released that was fully recorded in a state penitentiary. It was so, and it was also, and it's important to look at the dichotomy here. It was recorded there. It went on to be, it still sells. I've bought it, I don't know, a dozen times in different formats. But it was also fully rejected and denied worth doing by his label. Who wants to hear songs sung by a bunch of convicts? I mean, that's why we put him in prison, isn't it? This was the attitude of the label. It was the attitude of a lot of people in the culture. But Johnny Cash was being altered by the spirit that said, these are human beings with stories that, that I want to hear. They write me letters. They sing my songs already. I want to do this. This, this is something he listened, he loved, he believed these folks we're worth singing to. And we have the tradition now of Folsom Prison Blues. He believed it so much it was worth risking his career over. It was a big deal that May of 1968 when that album came out. It was a big deal that he did it. Now, generally speaking, it would be people would have clapped and been excited if he had said, I'm going to do this thing on my own, me and June and some of the fans, we're going to get together, we're going to sing. And we might go occasionally back and forth, but he said, no, 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 no. I want it recorded live, and I want everybody to experience this. That's a different thing. He made public what so often is, is brought into the, to the, the private. But that's not the prison story I want to tell this morning. You're going to get a couple. The prison story I want to share this morning was a story shared to me at annual conference in Rio, Texas. Uh, I want to thank you all for the gift that it is to trust uh, my process. It has been a difficult, I did not imagine it would be this difficult to, dis to make prayerful decisions about where I want to serve. And so a part of that, um, largely because of Kathy's uh, wisdom in, in saying, like, it's really important it's real important that you go and you see these people that you've worked with sort of tangentially, right? Um, so I went to Rio, Texas, and I sat there, and I, I met with people, and I shook hands, and I did the thing, and I got real excited because one of my favorite heroes of modern days is Dr. Ashley Bogan, um, who is the United Methodist General Secretary of the General Commission on Archives and History. Now, those of you that know Harley, you know that that makes me really happy. I'm a history guy. And so that we have this strong voice in the, in the archives and history that goes around and she says she's on a circuit writing tour right now to the annual conferences. 
and she's visiting. But she shared this story that um, surprised everybody in the room. Now, annual conference, for those that may not be part of our tradition, it is mo- clergy and lay people. Um, so it's a lot of theological education in the room. And she put a challenge out there and said, I wonder if any of you know this Wesley story. Wesley, early on, when they were barely being called Methodists, around the same time uh, of that sort of name coming about, they had made some commitments. This holy club, this small group, this rebel-rousing group um, at Oxford started visiting prisons. They started, visit, they started uh, visiting poor houses, um, coal mines, all these sort of things. We talk a lot about the coal mines in the church. We talk a lot about uh, the poor in the church. We don't mention prisons very often. It's uncomfortable. But Wesley was there all the time. Wesley, uh, they regularly visited prisons and they were meeting the needs of those that were most harmed in prisons. It wasn't so much, again, they could have easily been like, oh, we're just going to do this thing on the side. We're not going to tell anybody. You know, we're going to get together. We're going to serve. But it was a big deal because it moved. It necessarily moved from service to advocacy. They couldn't, Wesley and his friends couldn't understand why certain people were being harmed in specific ways. And so um, it, this movement from care, from, uh, with care and advocacy meant necessary conflict. When you care enough to advocate, conflict happens. This conflict was surrounded by a man named Thomas Blair. John Wesley, on the day of Thomas Blair's trial, a trial that Wesley and his friends got together and said, we're going to gather up evidence. We think that we believe him to be innocent. And we believe, more than anything, Thomas Blair is a child of God who loves, uh, who deserves the grace that is flowing into Thomas Blair's life. And we're going to be there on that day. He woke up at four in the morning and rode 12 miles on horseback to be at the trial. Blair was found guilty, but he wasn't given a life sentence or death both of those options for the crime that he had committed. Now, the problem with being, found, being uh, given not a life sentence or death and is that you've got a fine to pay. Well, someone who's been in prison a whole long time doesn't have a whole lot of money. And he needed about 5,000 pounds in today's money, or 6,300 U.S. dollars. Now, I wanna, I'm going to do what, Ashley, what Dr. Ashley Bogan did. Who do you think raised that money? John Wesley, the Holy Club. He went back and he said, we've been talking about Thomas Blair. We've been thinking about him. We've been praying with him. We've been seeing him as a beloved child of God and he needs to be free. And so they collected that and he was set free. Wesley saw in Thomas Blair and surely others, lots of others that he would meet in prisons, human beings. And he believed that even though that he lived in a society that was doing harm, refusing good for some, and only loving God by mouth service, that there was another story to be told that involved do no harm, do good, and keep in love with God by loving God and loving neighbor. Wesley himself, early on, was being altered by the Spirit, and the result was to become part of Thomas Blair's too-good-to-be-true testimony. It'd be easy to think that this was simply a conflict between Wesley and those who wanted Blair to suffer. But, you know, it's important to mention that this movement of the Holy Club put Wesley in conflict also with the church. These not yet Methodists were, quote, lowering themselves to do good work in prisons and poorhouses, but advocating for somebody guilty of a crime too delicate to mention is moving from the bizarre but tolerable to the reprehensible, end quote. This, these Methodists, this Wesley, this, this way that is working itself out, this kind of solidarity was moving from, I love the, I love the phrase, to the bizarre but tolerable. How many of you have done things that were bizarre but tolerable? But the Holy Spirit's working on Wesley, and Wesley moves into what the church would say is reprehensible. And they called him Methodist. And Dr. Ashley Bogan, 
along with Peter Forsyth, a, a British um, student study of Wesley, uh, mentions that that is the first time in print. There is no evidence before that in print of us being called Methodists. It is within our DNA to advocate, to care for, to serve, to be alongside those Look at them and say, you are so fully loved by God. Grace is all over your life. And we all looked with a little bit of shame in our hearts that we didn't know about Thomas Blair. We were more comfortable with Wesley in hospitals and coal mines and things like that. So she says, surely this is a story we would all should know. And Peter's jailbreak story. So let's get into the scripture, right? This is why you're here. We should look closer at Peter's jailbreak story. I think it's sort of this odd comedy, really. I think the church early on was probably sitting around campfires and meals. They were eating fish tacos because I'm from South Texas and everything comes in a taco, uh, as it should. Um, um, That was the grill, the tortilla. Um, Some of you all know. Um, I can imagine them sitting around wanting to stir their faith up and, and I want, you know, we talk about this sometimes when we're just hanging out on campus, right? Listen, the New Testament is allowed to be funny. It's allowed to be joyful. It's allowed to be a celebration. It's a funny thing, some of these parts of the story. They needed their faith stirred. Sometimes your faith stir- needs to be stirred in a very serious, heavy, weighty way. Sometimes you have to realize this is the first account of an automatic door. Did you notice the angel's walking Peter through, and the door opens in its own accord. So the next time you're at Target, imagine yourself as Peter, open at its own accord, and walk in and pretend that you're only going to buy the three things you put on your list. It's funny. It's, 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 and it's set, humor is important when it's set against tragedy. The first five verses of this chapter set it up way better than, than the text that we read, Right? This King Herod Agrippa I had been persecuting the church. He had murdered by the sword um, another saint, saint, and then took Peter. He took Peter with four squads of soldiers. Now, I looked it up. A squad is about ten soldiers. Forty people, one Peter. It was excessive, y'all. It was intentionally excessive. It was a show. It was a big deal. It was a power play. Add to this that in the story that we did hear in the reading this morning, there were two soldiers asleep. There was a soldier asleep on either side of Peter. They were close in. This wasn't like the Western movies and like the sheriff sitting there on his computer or reading a book and there's one person in the jail cell. This was a show. This was intentionally excessive. What we heard Lynn read this morning involves a lot of unbelievable elements. It's too good, it's too unbelievable. The church was praying while Peter was incarcerated unfairly, watched over by 40 soldiers, and awaiting the death that James had just gotten. Peter was sure this was the end. The church didn't leave, they didn't scatter across the face of the earth, they didn't abandon Peter. And how did they have that courage? They had the courage to pray and stay because they were being taught day by day that God's spirit regularly ignores, regularly ignores human means of power and carries people into freedom that they didn't expect. Amen? It's important to remember that the, sometimes the two good stories are interesting because they're not great for other people, and that's okay. I want you to know that's okay. Conflict is necessary when doing the work of Jesus. Those soldiers had a bad day the next day. Some of them probably didn't keep their jobs. And that's okay, because the story is bigger than that. Perhaps I think about Peter sleeping, and I think about he was ready. I think about Peter being ready to, to die. Another song by Johnny Cash. Peter believes he's having a sweet dream the entire text almost. Some of you have a sweet dream while I preach. It's great. Um, It was a dream that he could walk out of such a violent incarceration. 
It was a dream that justice might come for him and walk him out. It was a dream that he would still remain a witness to the power of God in his life to the people around him. It was all a dream. And suddenly the dream was a reality because the angel disappears. And he's left outside of the prison. He comes awake to himself and he goes to his chosen family, the early church, to do what? To tell a story that's just too good to be true. I wonder about the church, though. The church was also praying. They were thinking about the story they were involved in. They weren't separate from Peter's story. They might be next. Those 40 soldiers might knock on Mary's door soon enough. Gate. I've been writing door all week. It's a gate. So I say door, picture gate. The church is praying, but they, don't, but they also believe they're dreaming. They think it's a vision. They're more sure that Peter's died and come back as a ghost and and his ghost hands can go than they're sure that that God would walk Peter right out of that prison. And that's okay. Sometimes we're not sure the biggest story, the unbelievable thing, the thing that's too good to be true can happen. It's okay that we sometimes think that. There's parallels here of Jesus, and that's a different sermon, but It's amazing to think about Jesus walked through the the wall. I think it's hilarious that the angel walks up to the door, remember? First example of an automatic door. And then somehow Peter's stopped by a gate. Isn't that funny? He walks in, doors open, ah! And then he walks up to the gate for the church. Uh... right, as loud as he can. And Rhoda comes up, doesn't believe it. She thinks it's a ghost. She's like, oh, this is, so it's, it's humorous that Peter, even in his awakeness, isn't awake to the fact that he could probably just open the gate, y'all. He could just go in, right? God is still doing amazing things. What they're all learning, what the church is learning, what Peter's learning, what Wesley was learning, what we're learning is that the too-good-to-be-true story is the regular business of the Holy Spirit. It's what the Holy Spirit does then and now. Now this story takes place a long time before we have this glorious moment we have having right now where we're worshiping here and online. But it's not that far apart, is it? The church was praying for Peter. They were looking at Peter in their mind's eye. They had them in their heart and said, we can imagine what God might do and we're okay if it ends the way it's probably going to end, but we have an imagination. They're wondering what might happen. The church prayed from long distance. The audio video didn't match up that morning in church, but they prayed anyway. Church happened anyway, and Peter shows up at their gate. The earliest followers, bless you, the earliest followers of Jesus were learning how to pray, how to trust, how to believe stories that were too good to be true. The Spirit was literally walking Peter out of prison, past 40 guards, outside iron doors into a city as they're praying. Y'all, things are happening as you're praying. It's not a math problem, thank goodness, because I'm terrible at math. This is one of the reasons I went to seminary. (laughs) Not that there aren't people in... In seminary that are good at math, there are. I am not one of them. It's not math. It's not, oh God, do this. Uh, Here's a prayer, here's this plus 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 equals. Right? God's always, the Holy Spirit is always calling, always asking us into the story. While King Agrippa was laying violent hands upon those that belonged to the church, the church was praying. In fact, I I don't know if this was planned this way, but I feel like this story, this last part of the series, really wraps up the whole thing. The whole kaleidoscope is here, right? Um, It's witness. It's transformation alongside enemies. Peter didn't... Look, y'all, I'm... I'm good. I'm not always great. If I was Peter, I would be real tempted. If I noticed all those guards weren't touching me, I might kick one of them. I might point... You know, I might say some things that aren't all that Jesus-like. 
I was just dragged into jail. But the Spirit's moving, the Spirit's changing, the Spirit's altering in the transformation alongside our enemies, belonging on the edges of belonging, all of it is in this story. So what might we do with this story? How might we take it outside these walls and look for ways the Spirit is calling us to be altered by stories in our lives? What do you think of in your life that's too good to be true? It's just too good, y'all. Sometimes it feels like we're at a distance, that these stories are too old. We can't touch them. So if 68 or so CE is too far away this morning, perhaps 1732 is a little closer. And John Wesley coming alongside an innocent person and being in solidarity with them because they deserved it. They deserved love more than their incarceration. Maybe that's a little closer. Or perhaps our favorite patron saint of prisons, Johnny Cash, maybe 1968 is close enough. Maybe you go home and you listen to that record and you think about its impact. But maybe, maybe that's too far away as well. Maybe now, maybe as you're hearing this, maybe as you're grabbing for your phone to send a prayer text to Sharon Elliott Fox, maybe this week when you have lunch with somebody, maybe you're writing a testimony, maybe you're thinking of a story to tell, Maybe you're preparing your hand to knock at the door of this church, unsure of if you're praying or dreaming. Maybe that's where we're at this morning. Maybe we're doing both. Maybe we've got stories to tell and doors and gates to knock on. It's our choice. It's our choice to pray anyway. It's our choice to be in solidarity with those that are abused, even those abused by the church. It's our choice to celebrate the gifts of the world, the gifts that we see in each other, the gifts that we see alongside our enemies. It's our choice. We can choose so we can continue to dream, to pray, to work, to advocate, and to be altered by God, by Christ's redemptive work, and by the Holy Spirit's guidance. Let us choose, friends. Let us choose well. Amen. You have been listening to By the Well podcast from Wall Street United Methodist Church. Thank you for being part of our community. Just a reminder to visit us at wallstreetumc.org, and we invite you to like and share our podcast wherever you listen.